Okay, hello, good morning, everybody. Hello. Morning. <laughs> Great to see so many of you here. Um, my name is Farah, and I'm the Marketing and Communications Leader for Building Engineering London. A very warm welcome to Breakfast with Arab. And so to our speaker this morning. James was born and raised in Dorset, where the most significant industry was retirement. And it rapidly dawned on him that he would either have to join the medical profession or find a way of escaping using other career paths. After eight hours working with a jackhammer, James soon realized that construction work was not the right choice, and he duly attended the University of Reading studying mechanical engineering. He emerged six years later as one of the leading experts in designing regenerators for external combustion hot air engines. To his mind, this made James suitably qualified as a seismic surveyor, working in Oman and Libya on 3D oil surveys using large quantities of Semtex <coughs> to induce shockwaves into the various parts of the Sahara. So I asked James why he was doing this, blowing up bits of the Sahara, and it was for oil exploration, apparently. After one particularly gruelling night, which <coughs> ended up with James being held in a cell in Lib by the Libyan police for having broken a headlamp on his truck, he decided it was, it was time to return home to the UK and to settle into a more normal way of life. It was time to stop travelling and start to get serious. James joined Arup 27 years ago, and he's clocked up an impressive array of projects, which include the Leadenhall Building, the GLA, um, Hong Kong Air Cargo Terminal, and the Scalpel. And so, without further ado, it's really my pleasure to introduce the very charming and talented James Thonga. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Uh, we've got a lot to get through, so I will charge straight on. Uh, so decarbonisation of the built environment in the UK is essentially the talk that I'm giving today. And my starting point on this is the Climate Change Act uh, 2008, which essentially commits the UK to reducing carbon by at least 80% by 2050 from 1990 levels. So how are we going to decarbonise the UK? Well, as you can imagine, a lot of people have been putting their minds to this. And there are lots of studies uh, showing how these sort of things might be achieved. Uh, I mean, this is a particular one from DEC, and it tends to, as with a lot of others, goes through various targets in short time bursts, but essentially aiming towards the 2050, 80% reductions. It's quite often easiest to, to think of the UK uh, in terms of energy as, as a sort of series of uh, sectors. And those sectors sort of include things like transport, industry, um, buildings, power distribution, and the like. And again, these things are all being monitored. Uh, but essentially what is happening and what has happened over the last 25 years or so is that the carbon content of the UK has actually been going down. It's gone down by about, around about 25%. There's still a lot of debate about what should be included in our <laughs> carbon content for 1990 and also going forwards. Uh, so such things as aviation become a, a bit of an issue. Should it be included? Should shipping be included? Etc. But I don't want to dwell on that. Just taking these various sectors over the last 25 years, you can see that all of them have been reducing slightly some more than others. <coughs> um, we can project that forward, going from that last lot was 2012, going to 2050. <coughs> we need to get to a point which is obviously 80% less than the 800 <coughs> million tonnes of carbon dioxide in 1990. When you take things like agriculture and transport, we find that actually it's quite difficult to reduce the carbon content of those industries. Uh, transport have got some uh, solutions, if you like, or some proposals, particularly going for electric cars, obviously efficiency, but at the same time, there's likely to be more car journeys. Agriculture has the same sort of problems, um, but essentially a lot of their carbon dioxide is actually through release of methane. So there's some industries which are not going to be doing that 80% reduction, and that therefore means that other industries, such as energy supply, are going to have to significantly reduce, much more than just the 80%, more like 90 or 
as are the residential and the buildings side. So we really should be looking at 90% reductions. So keeping with the built environment, how do we actually use energy in buildings? Well, clearly we use it for lighting, for appliances, computing, and I'm talking about both uh, domestic and commercial as well. Building services systems, lifts, escalators, heating, cooling, hot water generation, cooking, all of these require energy. And that energy is supplied <coughs> by mostly the grid. The grid is supplied by wind and all sorts of other parts. CHP <coughs> is in there. Biomass is in there, gas is in there, even coal is still in there as part of our energy supply. Oil, of course, and liquefied gas for domestic in particular. District heating is coming up more and more and is one of the uh, systems that are supplying a lot of our heat in, in city centres. And of course, there's uh, solar thermal as well. <coughs> so with all these various ways of using energy, we've just got the the various sectors, if you like, the electricity, heating, hot water, cooking, cooling, and the energy supplies on the vertical. Obviously, uh, some energy delivery systems aren't able to do all of the requirements. Grid electricity, any, any electricity, can do all of the uses of electricity, heating, hot water, cooking and cooling. It can all be done by electricity. But gas, for instance, right at the top, can only do heating, hot water, and cooking. Um, and as you get down to the bottom, solar thermal is really only useful for hot water generation. So I want to start with the electrical supply. How is that going to decarbonise over the next 35 years? Uh, well, to start this off, it's worth just looking at what's happened over the last 25 years, going from 1990 down to the last date that we have, which is 2014. And you can see, first of all, it starts high. It uh, starts at 800. It goes down to around about 450. So there is already a large reduction in the carbon content of electricity supplied. That was the annual view of electricity supplied. But you can also look at this on a, on a daily basis. Uh, and this is a, uh, a web-based app that you can, you can get onto your iPhone, which shows you, for the last 24 hours, what the carbon content of the grid is and also how much power is provided. Uh, so the carbon content of the grid is, is this green line here. And first of all, you can see it, uh, it jumps around a bit. But it also um, matches the power, the total power supply for the UK. There's a dip here, which is overnight, which is as you'd expect. And that power is supplied by various uh, generators. So uh, the top bunch here is gas and this is coal, uh, this is nuclear, and this is wind, and there's a whole series of secondary supplies, such as the uh, interconnect with France. Uh, but this is constantly changing. So to say that there's one carbon intensity for the grid uh, is, is a little bit uh, misleading. It changes daily, it changes hourly, and it all depends on which fuel source you're using to supply the total demand. As you go into the future, we're aiming to get to around about 10% of the 1990 levels. So we're looking around about an 80 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. And what I've done here is just projected a, a straight line graph down to 2050 and then it flattens out, assuming that we still need some fossil fuel to get through the uh, balancing of the grid. It, it might look difficult, however, that is actually what France is already producing their electricity at. Obviously, they are a nuclear nation and uh, they are actually providing it at 0 0.085 at the moment. For us, there are various messages coming from government. They're not always consistent. However, one of them which came from COP21 in Paris was that by 2025, coal-fired power stations will be decommissioned. So there is a point in this graph uh, which appears uh, very achievable particularly if you get rid of the coal-fired power stations. Now, for us, we actually have to use standard uh, assessment procedures for assessing buildings, and it's very difficult to um, just use the instantaneous carbon grid intensity, particularly, as you see, it's varied both annually and, uh, and daily. So the SAP 
calculations are used in building regulations. And at the moment, they're trying to track where the grid carbon intensity is. There's a couple of points that you see at the moment. The SAP carbon content is significantly higher than the measured grid. But at some point, around about 2025, they're actually predicting that the carbon content is going to be lower than my straight line projection, which suggests that actually the straight line projection is, is, a, is a reasonable assumption at this stage. There's actually a 20% difference between current SAP and the average grid supplied. Moving on to heat. Heat for us uh, in the built environment is conventionally thought of as being a gas-fired boiler. Nowadays we have to use uh, condensing gas-fired boilers and they have an efficiency of around about 90%. And so we can plot this heat carbon content on the graph using gas as the fuel supply and 92% efficiency. You actually get a, a reasonably straight line graph. The reason it's not totally straight is because the fuel makeup of the gas is actually changing as we go over time. So there are a couple of blips in there, um, and essentially it's, it's because, particularly this, the, the, the blip in 2011, 2012, is really to do with uh, gas imports from Kuwait. So there's an interesting point here that after 2032, uh, the grid electricity will actually have a lower carbon content than a gas-fired boiler. Moving on, combined heat and power. Essentially, this is a generator connected <coughs> to an alternator, and you put fuel into the generator, you get electricity out of the alternator, and you get heat, which is recovered from the engine and from the exhaust of the generator. And this is quite often reviewed, and this is particularly taken from a DEC CHP manual. The way to look at this is to choose a power demand. So we put in fuel, 325. We're looking for 100 kilowatts of power which is generated at 31% efficiency. We're getting a 49% heat, so that gives you 160 kilowatt hours of, of heat, and you get some losses as well. You then review that in relation to conventional power supplies. And on this side, you're trying to match the power demand, so the power is the same. The efficiency is slightly higher, 38%, and it gives you a fuel input for the power station. And then on the same side, you look at the boiler efficiency. In this case, uh, taking an 80% efficiency for the boiler, which is a, 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 an old-style conventional boiler from about 20 years ago or so. And you have a fuel input for that as well. Add those two together, and you can see that the fuel input for CHP is significantly less than the fuel input for conventional methods. And that gives you your CHP saving of 30% in this case, assuming that you're going to use all of the heat from the CHP engine. Uh, however, this is a gas-fired CHP, and it's been <coughs> compared with a coal-fired power station and a non-condensing boiler. So it's worth just having a quick look and seeing what happens if you actually take current Duke's measured CHP values. And the first thing is the efficiency of the CHP is not as good as I said, it's actually 24%, not 31%. Uh, the heat is around about the same. It's gone down from 49 to 46%. And that should really be compared with, with power from a gas-fired power station, combined cycle gas turbine, which is around about 65% uh, efficiency, which, after transmission, ends up as around about 50% efficiency getting to the buildings. And if you use a condensing boiler rather than an old 80% efficient boiler, you actually find that the total fuel required from conventional is actually less than CHP. So these are measured figures. And the CHP saving for 2014 was actually minus 2% using the figures from Dukes. It's worth just <coughs> thinking about that because what the CHP suppliers are saying particularly with this particular calculation, is that CHP electricity is around about 568 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. And if you put that into an electric vehicle, uh, and I've taken a Nissan Leaf, 4.7 kilometres per kilowatt hour, it ends up as being 120 grams of carbon dioxide per kilometre, which actually compares with an Audi A4 petrol-driven or even a Jaguar diesel-driven. So it's not that great. And this is why 
it's absolutely essential that we drive down the carbon content and we don't want to accept high carbon from CHP. Going back to our graph, the next thing that's happening this year is that actually the SAP will change this year, 2016, uh, and it will actually go down by about 11%. And because the SAP calculation uses, uh, in CHP, uses the SAP calculation, it means that you are uh, going to be having around about a 20% reduction in the efficiency of the CHP, even using SAP calcs. And just by way of uh, completeness, I've just put in the electricity supply by CCGT, which is around about 360 grams, significantly less than we're uh, providing today. There's a difference of 30% between that and current SAP. We can actually look at the heat supply by CHP, showing the same graph. The carbon content of heat supply by CHP is this new purple line at the bottom here. And there's a couple of features on it. First of all, if you look at 1990, the carbon content was extremely low. And the reason for that is because you're offsetting all of your carbon onto the grid, which is up right up here at 800. As you go forward, uh, and you end up at 2014, you're using a much lower grid to offset the carbon. And this is why uh, this is creeping up. So it's almost an inverse of the grid carbon. As you project into the future, we've already done the electrics and the gas. As you expect, the actual carbon content of heat from CHP will increase until it levels out. And this is just literally following the graph from the grid electricity. A couple of points there. After 2025, the carbon content of heat from CHP will exceed the carbon content of heat from a gas-fired boiler. Just to say, this, this CHP is a, a CHP engine where we're using all of the heat, 100% of the heat is being used. So what about district heating with CHP? This is a favoured mechanism to get heat pipes into the ground. And it's worth just saying that the distribution losses are a significant part of running a district heating network. There's a lot, a lot of information out there about exactly where the heat losses are. But anywhere between 10 and 40% heat losses might be expected. And the electricity required to drive the heat networks is around about 3 to 5%. All of which means that there is an inefficiency for providing heat using a district heating system. And effectively that means that the graph going from CHP going up to district heating with CHP actually makes it worse. In 2013, the carbon content of heat from district heating using gas-fired CHP exceeded the carbon content of heat from a condensing gas-fired boiler. And by 2050, the carbon content of heat from a CHP uh, will be double the carbon content of heat from a condensing boiler in 1990. So clearly, that's going the wrong way. So if you are being connected to a district heating system using CHP, using a fossil fuel fuel base, you should ask your operator, how are you proposing to decarbonise your network over the next few years? And also, what will be your zero carbon fuel source? Moving straight on, heat pumps. Heat pumps have been around since uh, 1834, I'm reliably been told by Wikipedia. And uh, <laughs> essentially, uh, pumps heat from a cold source to a hot source using a compressor an expansion valve, so it's a reasonably simple <coughs> mechanism. We know these as fridges in our houses. They, they are heat pumps, taking heat out of the uh, refrigerator or freezer and putting it into the back of the fridge, into the heat projection circuit. For buildings, there are two primary sources or two ways of doing this. One is an air source heat pump and the other is a ground source heat pump. Now the air source heat pump has a COP of two and a half. That means for every kilowatt of electrical energy you put in, you get two and a half kilowatts of heat out. And for the ground source heat pump, you get a COP of four. So one kilowatt in, you get four kilowatts out. Uh, and the reason for that is essentially because the heat transfer mechanism for the ground source is better, uh, and the average temperature of the ground is higher than the average temperature of the air when you need the heat. This can then be plotted and you get the red graph. 
which is essentially, uh, this is for the air source heat pump, COP of two and a half, and it's just mirroring the electrical grid. So essentially it's two and a half times less than the electrical grid, but the interesting thing is it ends up as being a very low number by the time you get to 2050, which is another reason why we want to try and drive the electrical grid down. So in 2014, carbon content of heat from a heat pump with a COP of two and a half was 30% less than a heat from a gas-fired condensing boiler. It's less than the heat from a CHP and also less than the heat from a district heating system using fossil fuel. And by 2050, it's around about 85% less. For completeness, then, I've just put in the heat pump uh, for ground source, which is a COP of four, and it's an even lower number, as you could expect. So 55% today and almost 92% less than your starting point in 2050. So going on to the energy sources used in the buildings in the UK in 2050, this is what we had today. But actually there's going to be a number of these systems we're not going to be able to use. So the ones I've crossed out, CHP, which I'm assuming is, is a fossil fueled CHP, not a runoff biomass. So CHP goes, coal goes, oil goes, LPG goes, district heating, I, I really should have split up district heating to uh, low carbon district heating and fossil fuel district heating, so forgive me for that. Uh, however, that won't be uh, acceptable if it's still run on fossil fuel. And on top of that, going into London, you also won't be able to use biomass. So you really are left with a very few systems that you can actually still use. Now that sounds like quite a big task, but actually it's, it has occurred before. So in 1950, uh, when the Clean Air Act came in, there was a big shift to get rid of high carbon, high sulfur fuels, so that by 2000, we'd got rid of coal, we'd got rid of oil, uh, and uh, we had transferred a lot of our heating demand into a gas-fired supply. And that meant every single delivery mechanism had to be changed at some point. We can then project this further, and what we want to do is obviously try to reduce the total demand, which we will continue to do using energy efficiency techniques. But you can see here that the gas will have to diminish and head towards zero as you get to 2050. Electricity will take over, and there will be some other systems such as waste, solar power, any renewable fuel will come in and fill this spot. But effectively, the system will be electricity run. So what are the, uh, the summary of the effects of the Climate Change Act? Well, the good thing is that all of these energy efficiency measures that we are putting in uh, will continue. So insulating our properties, low energy lighting, uh, all of the good stuff that we're doing already in buildings will continue. Um, but there will also be uh, applications for building up the stock from, uh, from poor quality into much higher quality and much lower energy. So no fossil fuels to be burnt for the heating in the UK. That's because we, don't, we can't afford it. We need, we need that fossil fuel to, to uh, drive our industry, to drive transport. And all district heating networks need to run on zero or extremely low carbon fuel. Heat pumps, there'll be a significant number of uh, heat pumps from air source and ground source. And hopefully there'll be a drive towards high energy efficiency energy recycling, which is essentially where, particularly in cities, where you take heat, which is rejected from buildings, uh, particularly computers, computer suites, the, and, the, and the rest, and start to reuse that in the low temperature networks uh, to, to supply heat to domestic dwellings. And so it's trying to find the synergies, and I actually think, rather than this being a kind of a doom and gloom, I think there's a lot of potential here. But the most important thing is to get the systems we're, we're, we're installing right to make sure that whatever we are putting in and whatever in infrastructure we are providing meets our objectives for 2050. 
So it's about trying to find the right investments now to last till 2050. Thank you very much. Sorry, I went over a little bit. Uh, um, yes, uh, do you have any questions? Hello, yeah. Uh, what do you think about green gas? Green gas, um, I think it has a place. Uh, clearly, uh, it, it will be, um, it should be delivered, but it should probably deli be delivered um, provided it doesn't affect agricultural uh, um, supply in, in other areas. Um, I think it's worth just kind of trying to, trying to look at how much gas is actually provided. And there's still a question, you know, regardless of where the, fossil f the fuel is, um, using it most efficiently is the most important thing. There has been a kind of tendency in the past to, to assume that because you've got a low carbon fuel that you can just burn it. And what is quite clear is whether your fuel comes from uh, recycled or, or uh, waste, um, you should use it in the most efficient way possible. So yes, all in favour of it, but only uh, energy efficiency is still paramount. You talk about um, going to uh, an electrically <coughs> driven um, domestic uh, uh, situation. Um, what happens when we switch the gas off? Do, does our electrical grid actually have the capacity to take, shift everything on to an electrical <coughs> supply? No. <coughs> the answer is no. So this scenario is assuming a, a, a big increase in the electrical supply capacity, uh, which all has to be built in. And that's why it's, it's a process that's got to go over the next sort of 35 years. It's not something you can suddenly do nothing about and then suddenly switch over one day and 2050. Um, so building up the grid is, in, is important. And efficiency is also important because uh, a lot of these scenarios assume that we will be using less energy anyway. So it's, that's why it's still so important to, to continue with our energy efficiency measures for all of our buildings. Um, so you mentioned ground source heat pumps. Um, do you think that would work for large scale regeneration projects with buildings being fairly close to each other because of high density? No, I, 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 I mean, uh, there are the, the right times to put um, different systems in. Um, and it all depends actually on the ground source condition, uh, ground conditions. So if you start, um, Holland for instance does, has a lot of um, ground source heat pumps and they are quite comfortable in heating up a commercial building for about four storeys. Beyond that, it doesn't, it doesn't have sufficient uh, ground connection. So, so that's a good, good starting point. Holland's got very good water uh, uh, content in, in the ground, which makes it a good, good heat transfer. Um, so actually, uh, for us, it may be one story, it may be four stories. Um, but you know, geothermal is, is another, another way of going. But um, there's, no, there's no kind of magic bullet that says, you will always use this type of system. Sorry, uh, what do you think would be the, the role of photovoltaics in the next <coughs> 40 years? Because we still see very few applications in the UK compared to other countries. Yeah, um, I mean, I suppose there is this problem about uh, supply, so constant supply. At the moment, photovoltaics are essentially being used. Luckily, they're being used at the high peak uh, or, or producing at high, high peak output. Um, but all they're doing is offsetting... Um, uh, fuel and when that fuel becomes less carbon intensive there's a kind of debate as to whether it's kind of worth continuing to do that um, and effectively you're, you're kind of dumping uh, uh, electrical supply onto, onto the grid um, which it may or may not want so I, I'm kind of I, I think for me the jury's out on that but essentially if you can balance your demand um, in your building with the, your supply, then you're not actually affecting anyone else. So you kind of use as much energy as you possibly can in the building 
That's the most efficient use of, of PV. And I think we've been slightly distracted by, um, by the way in which we do various systems, uh, the way in which building regs is, is rewritten, and obviously some confusion about feed-in tariffs, which is uh, not helping the situation. Um, I think it's got a role to play, but probably not massive. Have you used this argument, this rationale, to make the case for local authorities not to make uh, um, mandatory contributions towards their CHP systems, yes. their uh, distribution <laughs> systems? Yes, I have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Successfully? Uh, they, they, I believe, are listening. Um, and we have, uh, I think, as more and more consulting engineers go to... to people like the GLA and say that there's a problem here, I think um, they're beginning to realise that uh, there is no long-term future, and they have known for some time. Their argument has been that, they, that by putting it onto a CHP with fossil fuel, you can make some money and you can put the infrastructure in. My concern about it is that we're putting in district heat networks that are high temperature and which rely on a high temperature fuel source. So if there is no fuel source out there in the city, um, and really there aren't that many high temperature, low carbon fuel sources anyway, um, we are ending up with a whole series of networks which don't have a future, in my view. But yeah, the, the problem is it is political. Um, and we've just got to continue to to beat the drum on this one and make sure that they understand. So do you see, do you see other, other energy sources? Because we will have sites across London with district heating network installed. So we need yeah. to take off the CHP and put something else instead, so. <laughs> well, it is difficult. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do. Um, and particularly the quantity of, of heat required is, is enormous. And I think that's why we are building up we're actually building up trouble for ourselves with these systems in the future. Um, yeah, you could ship in biomass from, from Canada, but it's probably not a great idea. Um, uh, and, y you know, may maybe there's some geothermal, for instance. I don't, I don't know the particular sites. But these things all need to be explored. And uh, the, the options, as you know, are limited. But each uh, site might give its own, uh, its own solution and some may not. Yeah, I think uh, it's clear that uh, particularly for heat, uh, the challenge is huge and uh, we can't be uh, going down the wrong route, uh, which is probably um, you know, large scale, high temperature district heating and, uh, and gas. Uh, and we need to be looking at much more uh, renewable solutions. Uh, but even that has a lot of challenges. So uh, home energy efficiency needs to ramp up uh, much faster than it already is at the moment. It was an interesting talk, um, different from what I was advised by previous consultants, to be honest, because it was really uh, concentrating on the carbon and decarbonisation. Um, working on different projects across London, I think I will try to look at other solutions than gas fire CHP. But at the moment, because of legislation, we still have to go with gas fire CHP, so it's something we'll have to look at and we'll see what the future brings and what we will be advised by consultants. I really enjoyed it. I think it was very interesting in that he did an, carried out an analysis of different fuel sources so that we could understand the reasoning as to why he was he came to the conclusions that he came to, uh, which actually I completely agree with and, and, and have been through similar exercises. So it was really reassuring to think that a large practice such as Arabs were, um, were, were driving again in that way and also uh, uh, sharing their views with local authorities and governments to actually uh, sh to, to give some direction. So, so as a client, I think it's really quite important to understand how, uh, how we should look at things and how we should specify things to consultancies and to companies so that we can actually uh, ask sensible questions, ask questions that can be measured and questions that um, can, can actually progress uh, us as a country and as a profession uh, going forward. 
I really, what I'm saying is adding some reality and some grounding to what we're asking as a client. I think Jane just reaffirmed what we struggle with every day as sort of in the property world and construction world is the myth of CHP. I think it's a political ping pong ball. Um, we're there to tick boxes on planning legislation. And I think, you know, the science, and James showed it there, the science proves it's all a fallacy. Uh, firstly, from a point of view, I work for Langer Rock and I'm into nuclear. So I think that's where the future is, where the source is, is, is sorting the, the energy problem out at source. I think the challenge we've got is, is that uh, policy is governed by political cycles, which are all too short. And we're talking about a sort of strategy between now and 2050. And uh, it's, it's politically led, you know, and infrastructure and energy, which is part of the infrastructure, should be pulled out of the political domain. I mean, it's what Sir John Arm is trying to lead now. So these should be led by engineering decisions and not by politics.